Our story today is called Sustaining the Tree of Life. The tree stood in the middle of the village. Its trunk was so large that it took six people holding hands to reach around it. The roots were strong and wide and its branches spread out over the village square, offering shelter from the rain or shade from the summer sun. Its fruit was juicy, sweet, and plentiful. The people of the village loved the tree. The children played beneath it and climbed in its lowest branches. Young people knew that if you whispered your dreams to the tree, they were more likely to come true. People who proclaimed their love or friendship for one another beneath its branches found their relationships to be nourishing, and elders discovered that their sweetest memories could be counted on when they were near the great tree. The tree had been witness to so much, and when the breezes blew through the leaves, one could hear the echoes of generations, laughter, conversations, dreams, prayers, and songs. Animals loved the tree too. Rabbits burrowed under the roots, squirrels and monkeys lived in the branches, and bats and birds flew in to eat the abundant fruit. The tree just seemed to buzz with life. One day, a traveling merchant arrived in the village. He rested in the shade and ate two pieces of the delicious fruit. This fruit is incredible, he said. I would like to have some to sell in the next village that I visit. Who owns this tree? No one owns this tree. If anything, we belong to it. Well then, if no one owns the tree, then no one will mind if I pick the fruit, said the merchant and began to fill a basket. I mind, said the villager who was sitting nearby, and I am the keeper of the tree today. What do you mean, keeper of the tree? We each take our turn, being here with the tree. We could never own it. We are here as protectors, as sustainers. That is ridiculous. The tree doesn't need you. You can just take what you need, take what you want. The tree will continue. But the villager couldn't be persuaded. Sir, this tree isn't like that. We don't come here to take from it, even though we receive much. We are keepers of this tree because this is where we are nourished. This is where some of our most precious memories are. This is where our people have dreamed. This is where we remember who we want to become. Well, said the merchant, you may think that this tree is very special, but it doesn't need you to sit with it. That is preposterous. Ah, replied the villager, the tree itself may not need me, but what of others who come by? Just this morning, I was able to sit nearby a woman whose heart was heavy with worry. Had I not been here, she would have had to carry that weight alone. And this afternoon, a tired couple came by and they sat just on that bench over there and rested. They said they had been looking for a place like this. And then an elder came by and we watched the birds in the branches together. And now you are here. And you were confused about what this tree is and how to be with it. Imagine if you had arrived and not found anyone here to talk with. You might have continued to think that everything you do is all about you. But luckily for you, I am here to let you know that when you care for the tree of life, my friend, it becomes about so much more than you. And the merchant sat for a while in the shade, thinking about these ideas that felt new and a little challenging. 
As the sun went down, he picked up his bag and headed out of town, whistling a song that he hadn't thought of in years. And on his way, he shared a smile with every person that he met, his heart feeling strangely light and joyful. And the people of the village, they continued to sustain the tree of life, to make promises to one another, to care for one another, and to share their gifts with grace and gratitude. May it be so for each of us. Greetings. I'm the Reverend Lynn Gardner, and along with the Reverend Wendy Bartell, we serve the UU Congregation in Schenectady, New York. We're grateful for the connections that allow us to be part of your worship service today. Our reading is called To the People Who Have Mistaken Freedom for Liberation by our friend and colleague, the Reverend Teresa Soto. To be free. You must embrace the breadth of your own existence without apology, even if they try to take it from you. You must know not that you can do whatever you want. You are not a kudzu vine eating entire hillsides for the purpose of feeding your own lush life. You must know instead that inside you are entire universes, milky blue, magenta, and gold expanding. But to actually be free, you must know and you must fight for the entire universes inside of everyone else. Being free is not a license, but a promise. I was a senior in high school, almost 18, and had just finished an evening shift working as a checker at Long's Drugstore. My boyfriend at the time also worked at the same store, and he was giving me a ride home. We had had an argument earlier in the day, and we sat in the empty parking lot for a long while talking things through. This was way before cell phones, and frankly, even if I'd had one, I don't know that I would have thought to call home and let my parents know that I would be late. And I was late. Quite late very late. When we pulled up along the curb in front of my house, my father came outside into the dark spring night. He walked down the driveway to the sidewalk as I got out of the light blue Chevy Love truck. My dad looked at me and quietly said, I was so scared. And then he turned and walked back inside. It was a potent lesson of interdependence and how personal freedom isn't the most important thing. 
Sure, I was free to stay out late, and my choice to do so impacted other people. I hadn't meant to worry my parents. In fact, I hadn't even given them much thought. And so that evening, they weren't free. They were weighed down with worry. Just so you don't get the wrong impression, this was not the only time that my parents worried about me, nor was it one of the bigger mistakes I've ever made. It is, though, a visceral memory of regret, and perhaps one of the first times that I really began to glimpse the notion that freedom is not a license, but a promise. I think another powerful part of this story worth naming is the vulnerability that your father expressed. Many men have been taught you have to be tough. Whatever you do, don't be vulnerable. And this is a terrible wound to men and boys. And for those of us who expect that the masculine people in our lives, we as a culture have to stop expecting men to always be strong, to always be providers and protectors. Toxic masculinity has caused harm for everyone. Your father demonstrated that strength can sometimes be vulnerability. He didn't come outside and yell at you or posture in front of your boyfriend, and he could have, and he would have even maybe been justified. It is too much a burden to bear, to have to be strong, stoic, the breadwinner, whatever, of that which lives in our collective psyches, consciously or otherwise. Certainly the men in my life have experienced feeling vulnerable, and I'm betting that there are times they wish they could have just said, I was so scared instead of the incredibly limiting societal expectations of toughness, bravado, and anger. Those expressions certainly have their place for all of us. There have been any number of situations in the last 100 some odd days in which putting on a brave face or feeling frustrated or even angry about COVID-19 or a government's ineptitude at handling this crisis. Rage certainly has its place. I mean, a global pandemic. Brutality perpetuated by a system of policing that has exceeded its usefulness. The weakening of our nation through greed and abuse of power. And dang it, we miss each other. We are mammals and most of us need and long for authentic connection to something beyond our own self. With all the changes in our lives, it is even more important to make space for one another's vulnerability. We certainly have been worried about those that we serve as well as the people in our own personal lives or even ourselves getting sick. We have been scared at times over these last few months, and yet as a leader, there are expectations to be strong. And sometimes the best display of our strength is to show our vulnerability. You may have heard of the social science researcher, Brene Brown, who has done some amazing work about vulnerability and shame and how they manifest in us. We encourage you to honor your feelings, whatever they are, as they come up. Don't wallow there, but feel them. Shame undermines our ability to feel, telling us how we should be rather than how we actually are. There are dozens of emotions that we are capable of. Let us promise one another emotional freedom wherever we are on the gender identity spectrum. In mid-June, our local interfaith group, Schenectady Clergy Against Hate, invited us to be part of a community panel to discuss some of the ideas in Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Kendi is clear about a few things. Racism is real, and we are all a part of it. In the beginning of the book, Professor Kendi notes that we have often used the word racist as a pejorative rather than as a descriptor. We have equated the term racist with, I don't like you. And that is, and it is often an accusation followed by a defense. You're racist. No, I'm not racist. Kendi names that there is no not racist. He says it is a claim that suggests neutrality. There is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist. It is 
anti-racist. He continues, one endorses either the idea of racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people, which is racist, or locates the roots of problems in power and politic, power and policies, which is anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere, which is racist, or confronts racial inequities, which is anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. That shift alone in our understanding of our work to grapple with the culture of white supremacy in ourselves and in the world is huge. And the good news is that each of us can choose to think, say, or do things that are anti-racist, and we can support and help create anti-racist policies. Grappling with racism honestly helps us all to get more free. Kendi acknowledges that we don't usually use terms to define the term itself. And he says definitions are important as we need to name and define the problem if we are ever going to overcome it. He says, racism is a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequities. Racial inequity is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal footing. Every one of us has thought, said, or done things that are based on racist ideas. And we have all, at times with or without conscious choice, supported and benefited from racist policies. Remember, racist as descriptor rather than as pejorative. Most of us have been taught that racial discrimination is wrong, so it can be hard to learn that we, Yes, white people and people of color have expressed racist ideas and supported racist policies. Racial discrimination, though, Kendi says, is an immediate and visible manifestation of an underlying racial policy. When someone discriminates against a person in a racial group, they are carrying out a policy or taking advantage of the lack of a protective policy, he says. We all have the power to discriminate, and only a few, an exclusive few, have the power to make policy. Focusing on racial discrimination takes our eyes off the central agents of racism, racist policy and racist policy makers, or what Kendi calls racist power. So as we do this dangerous and desperately needed work to dismantle racism, we need to be more sophisticated in our thinking and our analysis. I seriously doubt that anyone listening to this is actively and intentionally engaging in racial discrimination. You would be hard pressed to define UUs who consciously think white people are superior to black and brown people. And yet for those of us who are white or socialized as white, we have been conditioned by centuries of racist policies to ignore the system of racism and focus only on the individual acts. It's a bit like the scene in The Wizard of Oz when the little dog Toto pulls back the curtain, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, as we are supposed to be wowed and intimidated by the great and powerful Oz illusion of smoke and booming voice and bright green light. But we must pay attention to the system of racism and oppression, that man behind the curtain, if you will rather than just the illusions of individual discrimination. Kendi also invites us into a more sophisticated view of racist. Most of us have been taught that someone is a racist or they are not a racist. And certainly most of us would want to say that we are not a racist. But as we said, he thinks that's neutrality and there is no neutrality in the anti-racism struggle. His work asks us to go deeper. He says racist and anti-racist are like peelable name tags that are placed and replaced based on what someone is doing or not doing, supporting or expressing in each moment. These are not permanent tattoos. No one becomes a racist or anti-racist. 
we can only strive to be one or the other. We can unknowingly strive to be a racist. We can knowingly strive to be an anti-racist. Like fighting an addiction, he says, being an anti-racist requires persistent self-awareness, constant self-criticism, and regular self-examination. Kendi is also clear that to be an anti-racist is also to be anti-homophobic, because there are people of color who were gay, lesbian, and queer. To be an anti-racist is to acknowledge differences in ethnicities and to amplify the voices of those who are working class and poor. To be an anti-racist is to be feminist and womanist. It is to affirm those who are disabled, those of bodies of all sizes and shapes, those who are transgender, who are immigrant, who are undocumented, who are gender non-conforming or gender queer. To be anti-racist is to create and support policies that support people, particularly those who live at the intersection of oppressed identities. Freedom is not a license. It is a promise. What freedoms do you have? Which freedoms are you willing to work for? This faith claims that we are interdependent, that we are connected to everyone and to everything. To actually be free, the poet wrote, you must know and you must fight for the entire universes inside of everyone else. One of the gifts of religious community is that it can be a place to practice fulfilling promises. Our congregations can build our capacity for anti-racism work and collective liberation. Our congregations can affirm vulnerability and create opportunities for reflection and connection. To get to know the universe inside ourselves and one another. It is a place to change course, to change our minds, to be changed by what we learn and what we experience together. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. With each breath, I'm willing to work for your freedom as well as my own. That is my promise. That is our promise. That is the promise of this faith. May we answer this promise of the spirit that faith, hope, and love may abide. Let us answer the call of love with a resounding yes, that we may bring more freedom liberation, strength in vulnerability, and more equity into this world. May, May it, it be, be so. so. Amen, Amen. And, and blessed be. be.
Hello there. It's been so nice to have Reverend Lynn Gardner and Reverend Wendy Bartell here to share their ministry with us all the way from Schenectady, New York. That's 440 miles away from East Shore. This level of collaboration would be almost impossible outside of this online format. Or at least very costly in mileage reimbursements. Speaking of costly endeavors, thank you for continuing to send in your pledge checks each month. It is you and your contributions of time, wisdom, care, and yes, money, that keep East Shore running strong and allows us to actively live out our mission to love, revere, discover, and connect with each other and the community around us. If you have the extra funds and an interest in loving and connecting with our community, please send in a little extra for our loose offering this month. For the month of August, the half of the collection that doesn't stay here at East Shore will go to the Family Planning Association of Northeast Ohio. Now, we are working toward alternative payment methods for future months, but for now, please send your check by mail to our office with loose offering written in the memo line. Your contribution supports reproductive health services offered regardless of an individual's ability to pay. Thank you for continuing to support us and our community partners as do we do our best to make the world more loving, more compassionate, and more just.
Our final words this morning from Kimberly Quinn Johnson, borrowing from and inspired by Poem for South African Women by June Jordan. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are not perfect, but we are perfectly fitted for this day. We are not without fault, but we can be honest to face our past as we chart a new future. We are the ones we have been waiting for. May we be bold and courageous to chart that new future. May we have faith in a future that is not known. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We join hands in Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, placing ourselves to an individual religious freedom which transcends all creeds, not to think alike, but to journey together. Hong Kong! <laughs> Coffee hour! <laughs> <laughs>